me give you a couple of quick reminders. One of those is that uh, the book that I'm holding, which is our lectureship book, we're, we're very pleased uh, to have this book, and, and uh, we are able to have those printed and have, have those available to you. Uh, and if you're interested, those, those are available in the back. I also want to remind you that the website is, uh, you're, you're able to see the lecture online and uh, obviously you all are here so you won't be doing that hopefully over the next few moments but uh, those couple of reminders and now on to our our speaker Jonathan McAnulty is <clears throat> here to speak to us for the 10 o'clock hour uh, he is the minister at the Chapel Hill Church of Christ I had to consult this to realize he's been there since 2011 it does not seem like he's been there that long. I have to tell you that uh, many years ago, I, I think I met him through uh, when he was working in association with Brother Charles Abbey, who spoke of him very highly. And then at a later point, uh, he and my dad got acquainted and he spoke of him very highly. And those are two people that I thought very highly of. And so I, I thought uh, I had uh, do better get to know him a little better myself and that's happened and um, it has been a blessing to me to have an association with him. He's married to Sandra. They have four children, two of whom are graduates of the West Virginia School of Preaching. And it may not surprise you to learn those are the two boys that are graduates of the West Virginia School of Preaching. They're with us today, Joshua and Caleb. And uh, their two daughters are at Freed Hardeman, Hannah and Leah. If you have the book, you may notice that they have an advertisement of sorts in here. <laughs> it reads, none of their offspring are yet married, and those with suitable candidates for said position may present credentials to Sandra for consideration. So, uh, <clears throat> we have some candidates in the audience. I don't know. We, we might have to screen some of those uh, folks. But uh, in any case, I don't know if he wants them married or just wants the extra space in his home. But uh, he got two down, two to go, right? Mm -hmm. As far as getting that space. We're very happy to have him with us today and hope that you'll give him your full attention as he speaks to us uh, on the, our next psalm. Jonathan. Well, good morning. It is a blessing and a privilege to be here with you this morning. I want to uh, thank those that have invited me, the lectureship committee, the elders here at Hillview Terrace. Our psalm this morning, the text is Psalm 12, and the title is The Purity of the Word. And the psalm does indeed speak to the purity of God's Word, but in a very brief way, taking it almost for granted. And so we're going to more or less this morning, as we go through the psalm, take the purity of God's Word for granted. It is a basic biblical doctrine that every Word of God is pure. And I could probably spend this hour and the next hour just talking about all of the reasons why God's Word is pure. But the psalm tries to make practical application of the purity of God's Word, and so that's what we're going to try to do as well this morning. But let us just very briefly, in case there is any doubt about the purity of God's Word, uh, dispense with a few reasons why God's Word is pure and why we should trust it. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in Him, says Proverbs 30 and verse 5. And as we consider the purity of God's Word, we recognize it comes from God's truthfulness, from His wisdom, from His power, from His righteousness, and from His eternal, unchanging nature. And for all of these reasons, God's Word is trustworthy. And when we talk about every word of God is pure, we need to understand that it is 
That purity is not just a, an ideal that we can look at and say that's, uh, that's something good. It is a fact, a foundation, an anchor that we can rely on as we make our decisions. And thus again, Proverbs 30 and verse 5, every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in Him. The purity of His word is immaterial if we do not actually trust Him. But God is honest. He is truthful. He cannot lie. And so when we read His Word, we know that everything He says is true. God is eternal in nature. He does not change. And thus, His Word, as an extension of Himself is unchanging. I can read Psalm 12, and it was written 3,000 years ago, approximately. It was written in a different uh, country, on a different continent, for a different nation, under a different covenant. And yet, the unchanging nature of God makes this psalm relevant to me. God is infinitely wise and understanding. He knows the hearts of men. And thus, as the writer of Hebrews says, His Word, it pierces us. It discerns our thoughts and our intentions. And every inflection of God's Word is exactly what it needs to be to convey the wisdom of God to us. There are those that sometimes will say, well, you know, I don't believe that God, who is infinite, can communicate properly to man who is finite. That's doubting the wisdom of God. God created language. He knows His creation. He can communicate to us effectively so we can understand it and we can apply it. Moreover, His words are powerful, for God is powerful. They will accomplish what He sets them out to do. And when we consider all of these different facets of God's Word, we know that the wise man trusted. He loves God's Word. He has confidence in God's Word. He knows that if he relies on God completely and utterly, God is a shield who will protect him just as God has promised to do. We can have confidence whatever God has said he will do, he is going to do that very thing. Now with that kind of as a backdrop, we come to our text and we come to the question of the text, which is, if every word of God is pure, if he is indeed a shield to those who put their trust in him, why do men seem to doubt so much? And when I say men doubt, I'm not talking about the heathen. I'm talking about why do Christians seem to doubt that what God has said he's going to do, he will do? Why do we trust in the world to protect us more than we trust in God to protect us? Why do we go at, uh, to sleep at night and the scriptures say, you know, he's going to watch over us and we feel the need to deadbolt our doors, lock our bedroom doors, put a gun under our pillow because we're scared that somebody might break in and kill us. God said he's going to protect us. Why are we doubting? Why do we make compromises when we come to a situation in which God has offered to watch over us and God has offered and promised to take care of us, but we're afraid that if we don't sort of compromise a little bit here or there, it's just not going to work out right. If we really believe in the truthfulness and the power of God's Word, why do we so often seem to act in a way which demonstrates a lack of faith in the promises of God? And that really, I think, is the question at the heart of Psalm 12. Psalms 12 is at its core a prayer. It is a cry to God for salvation and help. In fact, the first verse begins, Help, O Lord, or uh, in the English Standard Version, Save, O Lord. The psalmist is looking to God and asking for salvation from the wickedness of the world. The psalm is generally attributed to David, and uh, I don't have any good reason to dispute that. So we're going to assume David is the author of this particular psalm. 
And that places it in the context of the life of David. We don't know the exact historical situation uh, under which the psalm was written. There's no indication exactly why David wrote it. There's a few places in David's life where various authors will suggest perhaps it fits here or fits there. But, but in a general context, we can place it within the lifetime of David. We can place it within the nation of Israel, and we can place it within the political and historical events of David's life. And in that time period and in that situation, David is turning to God, and as David so often does, and I'm sure there are, there's going to be more than one uh, lesson today which deals with this, that, that David, when he needed help, he turned to God, but David turns to God. And, and as we look at the psalm, and I'm going to suggest in the, uh, the, my, uh, my text this morning, the, my manuscript, I provide an outline. Um, <clears throat> there's generally four parts to the psalm, verses 1 and 2, verses 3 and 4, verses 5 and 6, and verses 7 and 8. And so each uh, two verses creates a thought. And in my outline, I broke off the very beginning of the first verse as kind of its own outline, the, the actual cry for salvation. But verses 1 and 2 present us with the cause of distress. Why is David upset? And then verses 3 and 4, we have a uh, prayer, a prayer for justice. David wants God to act in the world. He wants God to, to bring justice and, and to punish the wicked. And then we have something rather unique in the Psalms. This isn't the only Psalm that does it, but there's not a great many that do. And that is God responds to the prayer. We have God's actual words of response to David's prayer. And that's verse, uh, verse 5. And then verse 6 is kind of a, a statement about what God has just said. And it is verse 6 that says every word of God is pure, or, or the words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace. And then the last two verses, verses 7 and 8, are a declaration of confidence in the midst of wickedness. And as we look at the psalm and we break it down in that way, we, we see, first of all, the cause for distress in verses 1 and 2. And David is pleading, save me, O Lord, help me, O Lord. And the word there is the same word from which we get the name of the prophet Hosea. It is a cry for help. It is a cry for salvation from the midst of distress. And uh, the reason that David is feeling like he needs God to help him is because as he looks around to his neighbors and he looks around to his comrades, he's come to the realization that he's all alone. As a godly man, he's feeling quite uh, isolated. He says very specifically, the godly one is gone. The, the, the godly man ceases. And the word cease there, it means he's come to an end. There used to be godly men around David, he says. He looked and he had friends and they were righteous and he had companions and they were good. And, and they're not there anymore. The, the godly man has ceased. He's vanished. The faithful man has vanished. David looks and he doesn't feel like there's a lot of other people who are really trusting in God's word the way that he is. Now, David's not uh, alone here. In fact, this is a fairly common cry for the faithful throughout the Bible. Uh, most of us remember 1 Kings 19 in which Elijah is being persecuted by Jezebel and he goes, uh, goes to God in, in sorrow and in distress. And he says, the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They have torn down your altars. They have killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left. He felt isolated. Micah. As he looks around at his situation, he says, The faithful man has perished from the earth. There's no one upright among men. Now, these statements, and God says as much to Elijah, they're, they're exaggerated, they're, they're uh, hyperbole. 
But they nevertheless portray a very real sense of isolation. And it's a sense of isolation that is going to be felt, I believe, by anyone who remains faithful to God's Word. And it's because, as the Lord observed in one place, there is a broad way that leads to destruction, and many go thereby. There is a narrow and difficult way which leads to life, and few there are that find it. Those on the way of life are always going to be in the minority. And being human, that creates within us a sense of isolation. We feel alone. And so David's feeling alone here. Now, I also want to comment very briefly, well, perhaps not so briefly, but I want to point out when our text and most translations say the godly man or the godly one has ceased, that word godly there is a very interesting word. And I'm not really going to quibble with the translation, uh, but it's from a, a Hebrew word that I'm given to understand really just means merciful or kindness. And kindness becomes the characteristic that is most prominent in the godly man that defines who he is as a child of God. When we think about what it means to be godly, it, it just means to be like God, and God Himself is merciful and kind. But we need to understand if we are not merciful and kind people, we are not godly. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24, it's a verse, and, and if I'm going to be blunt as a verse, I wish more preachers would read and memorize. A servant of the Lord cannot be quarrelsome. He can't be somebody who's constantly getting into fights. But instead, he needs to, to be gentle, able to teach, patient, kind, in, in humility or gentleness, correcting those that are in opposition. These are the characteristics that God is looking for in His servants. To be godly is to be merciful. In the Old Testament... God told His people, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And, and that word mercy in the English, we, we so often think of mercy in the context of forgiveness. But it's worth noting that really biblically, forgiveness is always a part of mercy, but mercy really just means to be kind. It means to, to treat people in a kind and loving fashion. And so in the days of David, they needed to learn this lesson, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And the prophets say the same thing. You need to learn this lesson, Hosea 6 and verse 6, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And we get to the days of Jesus, and he looks around at the very religious people of his day, and he says, you need to learn this lesson, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. I don't know how many times God has to say this to us, that He really wants us to learn to be merciful, which means He wants us to learn to be kind. The psalm elaborates on this. As we think, well, well what is it that David's seeing that is causing him to, to feel as if all the righteous men of God have ceased to be righteous? They've come to an end, and now they have joined in with the wickedness of the world. And the answer is found in the tongue. To be perfectly frank, they just weren't speaking to each other very nicely. Notice verse 2, and I'll be reading from the uh, ESV in this particular case. Everyone utters lies to his neighbors. David looks around, and, and men who are supposed to know better are lying to one another. With flattering lips and a double heart they speak. That is, he looks at, 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 at them, and when they say nice things, they don't actually mean it. They're just saying it in order to get an advantage over somebody else. David goes on and says, May the Lord cut off all flattering lips. And then notice also verse 3, The tongue that make great boast, or the tongues that make great boast. These men are proud of the way that they're behaving. And they are proud of themselves. And they're constantly telling others, Look how great we are. Look how great I am. And they're boasting. 
And then verse 4, those who say, with our tongue we will prevail, our lips are with us, who's master over us? These were men that thought they could talk themselves out of any situation. Sometimes, I think in, in the church today, and I, I don't know, I haven't lived in every century and in every decade, so I don't know, this could be the way it almost always is. But I always get the feeling like we downplay the sin of the tongue, the wickedness of evil speech. And as I get older and as I read the Bible more and more and I start to go through what God has said in every age, I notice that God has always stressed the wickedness of the tongue. Jesus says in Matthew 12, 36, men are going to give an account for every idle word they utter. And if we go back to Matthew chapter 5, I find it interesting that Jesus says, you've heard it said of old, you shall not murder. But what does he go on and talk about? He goes on and talks about, but I say to you, whoever's angry with his brother is in danger of judgment. And notice what Jesus does there. He says, you know, murder is bad. Yeah, but pay attention to how you're talking to one another. If you start calling your brother names, you're going to go to hell. Yeah, murdering your brother, that's not a good thing. Don't do that. But if you call him fool, you start uh, cursing at him. Well, you're just as guilty as the murderer. James chapter 3, famous chapter about the dangers of the tongue. James talks about the tongue is a world of fire and it itself is set on fire by hell. And what's he saying there? He's saying your mouth can get you into a world of trouble. And moreover, it is demonic and it's devilish when you do it and you're going to lose your soul over it. If you get to the end of James chapter 3... There's a, a break there, but I don't really think it's a break. He goes on and he, he begins talking about wisdom that's from above and wisdom that's from below. The wisdom that is from below, it's sensual and demonic. And you read what he's talking about there, and he's talking about people who use their mouth to attack others, to malign others, to lie about others. And he's saying when you are sowing that sort of division, that's not, that's not God at work. That's demonic. That's evil. The wisdom that's from above is pure and peaceable. And so in our text, the evidence of evil is not found in bloodshed. It's not found in fornication. It's not found in human sacrifice. It's not found in any of those things. When David looks around the world and he sees evil, it's found in lies. It's found in pride and boast. It's found in false flattery. It is found in, in people who believe that they can just talk themselves out of any situation. And David says, where's the righteous man in all of this? Now, I don't know the exact or, uh, the historical context of the psalm. But it, and it may just be our, our day and age. But as I read it, I, I start thinking about politics. And, and David was a politician for much of his life, involved in the leadership of his country. He was king. He was surrounded by politicians. They're not a, a new breed. And, and I kind of see politicians in, in this. I'm, I'm going to try to stay away from speaking about anyone specifically here. But read Psalm 12 and think about men who, they're not trusting in God. They're trusting in smooth talkers, the art of the deal. And that's a slight political reference, but that's what they're trusting in. They're, talking, they're trusting in their ability to make deals and to compromise and, and to use their tongue to get what they want. I kind of suspect Absalom might be at the heart of this psalm. 2 Samuel 15, Absalom was doing that. He'd sit by the gate, and when people came by and they had problems, he'd say, you know, if I was in charge, I'd fix that for you. I, he didn't really care about the people. He was trying to seek power, but he would promise whatever they needed to hear in order to accomplish his ends, and people were listening to him, and it led to a civil war. But I can hear people say, you know, Absalom, yeah, he has some issues in his personal life. Yeah, okay, maybe he's killed some people he shouldn't have killed. But he's a man that knows how to get things done. And then by the end of, you know, Absalom's career there, uh, Absalom, he's exactly who we need in this situation. And if they didn't believe that, they wouldn't have joined his army to fight against David. If they didn't believe he was exactly the person they needed to solve their problems. But men will do that. They'll, they'll, they'll start making compromises, and, and then they'll go along, and in the end, what they're doing is they are 
glamorizing and exalting and uh, enjoying behavior that they shouldn't enjoy or glamorize or exalt. And I kind of suspect that's what's going on uh, in David's life at this time. But as David considers that, and he prays for God to act, and as he, he prays for God to, to look at the world and to be aware of the wickedness, God answers. And so verses 5 and 6, verse 5 in particular, God responds, because the poor are plundered. Now, I find this interesting because up to this point, it's all been about how men lie to one another and are willing to say anything. But God says, because the poor are plundered. And so that gives us a little bit more of a, a broader uh, understanding of the situation. Men are using their words to take advantage of other people. Because the needy groan, I will now arise, says the Lord. I will place him in the safety for which he longs. God is going to act. He's going to do what is necessary to save uh, the people that are in need. And here God provides hope. And the psalmist then declares the words of the Lord, their pure words. You can trust what God says. God is mindful of the needs of his people and God is going to act. He's going to save. He's going to step forward and do what needs to be done. God is aware of the wicked. As Psalms 1 reminds us, the wicked will not stand in the judgment. God is aware of what wicked men do and he is going to act and he is going to, to respond there to as appropriate. And the psalmist says, I can trust what God says. His words are pure. Again, not just pure as an ideal, but pure as an anchor. They are something we can rely on. We can have confidence that God will do exactly what he says he's going to do. And in fact, that's verse 7. You, O Lord, will keep them. You will guard us from this generation forever. If God has said it, we can trust it. And we could kind of end the lesson right there. God said it. We can trust. It's interesting, though, the psalm does not finish there. The psalm goes on and has one more verse. And it's almost a discordant note. It's, we've had the prayer. We've had the response. We've had the confidence. And so what do we end with? On every side, the wicked prowl. As vileness is exalted among the children of men. Men still aren't what they need to be. God has promised to act. He's promised to judge. Yet as the psalmist looks around, there's still vileness. There's still people not doing what they should be doing, not speaking to one another nicely as they should be. And in the immediate moment, evil seems ascendant. And we might ask, well, why does the psalm end on that note? Because it really ends on a down note, doesn't it? We can have confidence in what God says. Look at how wicked everybody is around me. That, that's the psalm. But he does that, I believe, because he is presenting to us a choice. And it's one thing to say, I trust in God. And then it's another to step out and live like we trust in God. Because sometimes the evidence of our eyes seems to contradict the faith of our heart. And so what do we do? I want to reiterate that as we look at the psalm, and again it was written 3,000 years ago, different time, different place, people haven't changed. And politics hasn't changed. And used car salesmen haven't changed. I mean, they probably had used camel salesmen that would say anything to sell an old lame camel to you at half price and tell you what a wonderful deal you were getting. Gossip hasn't changed. We can look and we can see the world is still as it was when David wrote it. And I want to remind you again, this is not a psalm being written about a heathen people. This is not a psalm being written about a godless nation that was idol worshipers and, uh, and, and, and the wickedest of the wicked. This is David writing in the midst of uh, Israel in his day. And yeah, they had some problems. But when we look at you know, the golden age of Israel, this is it. This is when they were really kind of doing what they were supposed to be doing. They were religious. They weren't out worshiping the Baals. That was yet to come. 
They had begun under Samuel and Saul to finish the job that, that Joshua hadn't finished before he died. And so we've left that period of the judges and we've gone into kind of a restoration movement time, if you will. This is a nation that's supposed to belong to God and supposed to be righteous. And as David is writing uh, to them and about them, though, they're still not doing exactly what it is they need to be doing. Even in Israel, even when they were at their most religious, they still suffered the temptations that are common to men. And they still had to make the right choices. And that's hard because sometimes men who are religious start to tell themselves that what God desires most is sacrifice, not mercy. And we need to be careful that when we are being religious, we understand what God really desires is mercy over sacrifice. And I think the sacrifice is a good thing, and I am aware, and I think the prophets were aware, and David was aware. God commanded the sacrifices. We need to be doing those things. But God in every nation accepts men who fear Him and work righteousness. And the evidence of wickedness is in the world all around us, and very often that evidence of wickedness can creep into the church. We can see it in examples on the news, and very often we're tempted to look and, and uh, see the examples of wickedness in the most extreme of violence. Or politically, and I'll touch on politics for just a moment because I think we make a mistake here. We look at politics and we pick one issue, and it tends to be, I observe, the issue of abortion, and we think a man's stance on that one issue is what determines whether he is a godly candidate or an ungodly candidate. And I am opposed to abortion. I want to be very clear about this because I could get myself here in trouble and the next few sentences. I'm opposed to abortion. It's a great evil. And I believe God's going to judge us harshly as a nation and as a world for it. But I look at what uh, God says in the book of Proverbs. There are seven things that are an abomination to him. And we focus on the hands that shed innocent blood. And that's only one of the seven. Lying lips, God says. And then... Also, one who bears false witness. That would seem redundant, but God wants to stress that mouth, the tongue, the wickedness of it. And then what's the, the last one he says? Well, one who sows discord among brothers. And I go back to James 3, and I look in Ephesians 4, and I see Matthew 5 and Jesus' words there about calling your brother a fool. And I come to the realization, abortion is a great evil, yes, but if you are a politician who lies and cheats and is willing to say any vile thing about your opponents, you are just as wicked and just as hellbound as the abortionist. And a Christian who promotes these things or a Christian who says, because I am against abortion, I am going to sow discord among brothers has made has said, I'm casting off one wickedness and I'm going to embrace a different wickedness. And we're going to lose our souls either way. Because God looks at it, and go to Galatians 5, verses 19 through 21, and look at the works of the flesh there, and how many of them have to do with envy, and jealousy, and bitterness, and wrath, and clamor, and just not getting along with one another. Those are works of the flesh. And so we look, and homosexuality is a problem, yes. And abortion is a problem, yes. But that's not the evidence... That's not the extent of the evidence of the wickedness of the world. Gossip, slander, reviling, these things are conducts that should not be so and should not be so in the church. So what does God say? He says you need to have sound speech that cannot be condemned. Consider the fruit of the Spirit, love and joy and peace and long-suffering, and kindness, and goodness, and faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. And how many of those things relate to how we speak to one another? When God tells us to come out from among the world, to leave them and be separate, 
He's not just saying don't partake of the adultery and don't partake of the pornography and don't partake of the, the fornication and the drunkenness. He's also meaning don't partake of the strife and the enmity and the discord and the contentions and the fits of anger and the divisions and the like. Because those are works of the flesh just as much of, as the others. And sometimes we look around the church and we may have the right stand on instruments and we may have the right stand on baptism. But if we can't get along with one another and be merciful and kind, the words of David are coming true. The righteous man, the godly man, he ceased because mercy and kindness is the evidence of godliness. So as we look at the situation, what do we do about it? One answer, and this is, I think, the answer that they were giving in David's time, and it's the answer I see too many giving today, is, well, we need to compromise. Now, we don't word it that way. Nobody ever says, we need to compromise with wickedness. But we still respond in fear, rather than responding in faith. And fear always counsels us to compromise. We'll hear people say concerning how we deal with others, well, if they bring a knife, we need to bring a gun. We need to respond with greater animosity to their animosity. Or we'll see people, and again, I'm going to lightly step on politics here, we'll see people on Facebook claiming to be a Christian, putting forth numerous articles in favor of Christianity, and then in the very next post on Facebook, mocking and reviling their political opponents. And their political opponents may be wrong and evil, but do we remember that in Jude verse 9, Jude basically says, if you're facing the devil, you treat him kindly? You, you don't revile the devil? If we're supposed to treat the devil with politeness and kindness... Shouldn't we treat our political opponents with the same? But, you know, if they're going to lie about us, then we need to say whatever is necessary in order to win. And so winning political fights becomes more important than behaving in a godly fashion. And so we make compromises a little bit at a time. Never all at once. But compromise is kind of like a great rock rolling down a hill. The further along you go, the faster and more steam it picks up, the harder it is to stop. And eventually what happens is we get to Psalm 12 and verse 8, and we don't just see the wicked prowling on every side, but we see vileness exalted. That is, people are not just giving in to the wickedness, but they're pleased with themselves for doing it, and they're putting others on a pedestal for doing it. That's not what David did. Spurgeon, as he comments on Psalm 12, he reminds us of David's situation. There's that quotations in the, the manuscript. But essentially, you know, David, as he's in that cave and he has Saul in his hands, he can remember that Saul has murdered people he shouldn't have murdered. He can remember that Saul has behaved in an ungodly fashion. So what did David do? Did he take matters into his own hands and say, Saul is so wicked, I, I'm justified in whatever behavior I do towards him? Or did he say, I'm going to trust in God. I'm going to behave in the right way, even if my opponents are not. And really, that's the conclusion I think the psalmist wants us to come to, is that when we observe ourselves surrounded by wickedness and evil on every side, and we hear God promise, He will judge, He will save, He will take care of us. If we really believe that every word of God is pure, and we trust God to do the right thing, and we trust God to handle matters as He has promised to do, then what need do we have to compromise? We can be kind and merciful no matter how they are treating us, no matter how wicked their ideas are, no matter how bad their behavior is. We can trust in God and do the right thing. I can't quite see the clock. I think I have about four minutes. I, I want to very briefly make three specific applications concerning a faith that trusts in the purity of God's Word. And these are taken basically from Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. I don't have time to read that whole chapter, but as you read it, this is really what Paul's talking about there too. And again, I know so much of the Bible is about this one specific part of being godly. How we treat people that disagree with us. 
The fact that we can trust in God's Word and we can behave in a way that is better. But Paul makes a few points there in Romans chapter 12. First of all, he points out we are going to, if we trust in the purity of God's Word, leave justice in the hands of God. God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. We don't have to try to take matters into our own hands. If we really trust God to make things right, we can leave it at that. When we feel like we need to fix every problem, we need to solve every injustice, and we insist on others doing the same, we are in fact leaving the path of faith and righteousness. Because God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And every word of God is pure. We entrust it. Second thing that Paul points out in Romans 12 is that in the face of evil, in the face of an ungodly world, in the face of people mistreating us, we can respond with mercy and kindness. If your enemy is hungry, you can feed him. If he's thirsty, you can give him water. And by doing so, heap coals of fire upon his head. This is what Jesus said when he taught us, turn the other cheek. Don't resist an evil man. Jesus teaches that. And how often do we approach Matthew chapter 5 in Bible classes? And Jesus says, don't resist an evil man. And immediately the class turns to, let's find the loopholes. Let's find the exceptions. Let's find the reasons why we don't actually have to do what God says to do. But rather than repaying evil for evil, if we really believe in the promises of God, we don't have to hold grudges. We don't have to decide some people don't deserve mercy or kindness because while that's true, it's immaterial. And once we start down that path, we become judges with evil hearts. Thirdly, though, Paul says we can refrain from sin. Even when others around us are engaged in sin, we can abhor what is evil. We don't have to justify sin or wickedness in others or ourselves. We can say, God says not to do it. Let's not do it. Instead, we can cling to what is good. And that includes sound speech. That includes kind speech. That includes loving and forgiving and merciful speech. In, a midst, in the midst of a world filled with grumbling and complaining, God says, you be a child of light, shining. Do all things without grumbling and complaining. In this life and in this world, there's always going to be those moments when righteousness seems hopeless, justice seems to be a lost cause, and when it seems like the only way to get ahead is to behave in the way that others are behaving. But every word of God is pure. And if we truly believe what God says, if we really believe in the purity of God's word, we can walk in the promises of God, even when others around are not, and they're turning from the path of righteousness. And we can trust God to make things right. I thank you for your uh, time and your attention.